hello, folks. It's wonderful to be with you and, uh, and share some ideas and what I know is a really challenging topic for, for all of us. And I, I, I want to I tell you that it's not always been this hard to engage the public. It's not always been this toxic. There's been a lot of things that have been changing, but there's a lot of signs for hope because there's a lot of agencies that I'm going to refer to today that have gone beyond the, the regular strategies for public engagement and have found roots to create a more harmonious uh, discussion and dialogue and develop support for uh, the kind of work that you're trying to do in your communities today. So. Uh, the, the questions that I'm going to focus on today um, are really about why is it so bad today? What's happened and what can we do to fix it? That's, that's primarily what I'm going to talk about. How can you increase engagement uh, in, in planning uh, for your public input, uh, but also it, accessing traditionally underrepresented populations that normally are very, very difficult to reach. And the goal here is to build a real shared vision within your community for the kind of changes that you're trying to enact. Because the alternative to a shared vision for change is status quo, and usually that means not just staying the same, but getting worse, especially when we're dealing with population growth. I spend most of my time uh, as a trainer in public engagement best practices for a variety of organizations, so I'm going to be sharing what I've learned over the past, uh, I'm going to say 23 years in focusing on public engagement for uh, government agencies. The reason that I get out of bed is because the work that you're doing is improving the quality of life for communities, and there's, there's nothing that's more important to me than that, but I see how difficult it is. My, my mantra, my focus for this work is this guy here, or the equivalent, and many of you are these people, or the people behind the bench who are making these decisions. This guy is trying to make the case that the community is behind changes that are being proposed and he's in front of decision makers and he's got to do a tap dance to make it seem like it's actually a shared vision from the community. So when you look at the criteria, the, gr the grilling that he gets put through by decision makers, there's four key things that he needs to pass the test on in order to mo mobilize the kind of changes that you're talking about. He needs to convince people who are in decision-making roles that there is critical mass involved, that there was enough people that were there at the table uh, participating, but also that we've heard from a diverse cross-section of the population representing all of the key elements of our community. We can't leave any group out. We need to convince decision-makers that the information coming in about public opinion around these changes that you're talking about are informed, that they're trustworthy, that people understood the pros and cons, the trade-offs, and they support them understanding fully and not just being sold a bill of goods. And lastly, it needs to be quantifiable because let's face it, these people aren't going to go through all of the comments themselves. They're going to need to receive a summary somehow. So we need to be able to roll up to say, Four out of five people felt this. So it needs to, at some point, be quantifiable for those people. So if all of those situations are met, all those criteria are in place, you're, you're threading the needle in this, in this dot here, the result can be much more improved decision-making and much greater public support for the kind of changes you're trying to mobilize in your community. When we look across the country, it's not just happening here, across the country. There are two outcomes that we see repeatedly. The first one I call apathy. Uh, I can imagine, and I've done this before, um, maybe you've done it as well, trying to figure out how do we take the picture to make it seem like a great turnout came to our public meeting. <laughs> I call these people the STP. These are the same 10 people that show up to everything. 
It's incredibly difficult to make a case that the community's voice been, has been heard when you're looking at this. There's a second outcome, and the second outcome is you don't have a problem with attendance, there's lots of participation, but you're looking, you're staring down the fingers of the community. It's chaos. I call these folks the cave people. These are the citizens against virtually everything. Oh, I, I, I see you've met them. Well, so have I. As a result of doing this for 23 years, I need therapy. Who, who else needs some therapy? <laughs> Look at my face here. This is one of those situations. I'm staring at a whole bunch of angry people right here. We are, in this, in this photo, uh, I was running a public consultation for the nine counties that include and surround San Francisco, California, and Unbeknownst to me, before this public workshop, a group of people got together and decided to read a manual on how to disrupt a public meeting. And holy smokes, were they successful. Within 30 seconds, I knew that it was going badly. This is 43 minutes into a two-hour workshop. And, of course, it was filmed. So I am staring at this guy here, and a whole bunch of other people like him. And it was at that moment, literally that moment, when I realized, you know, we can, we can design public meetings differently, but there really isn't anything that will stop them from being very vulnerable to co-optation. There's got to be a better way to hear from people than the traditional format public meeting. So, let me just talk about what's changed what's changed over uh, the past. I would say uh, things have been going uh, south uh, steadily since the 80s, maybe even before that, but I've, I've noticed the trend um, and it seems to be getting worse faster. And so here's a few things that have changed. Free time has eroded away and um, virtually disappeared. People's amount of dispensable time has whittled to almost nothing. So, in 1980, it was very common that there was one person working in the household. Is that true anymore? No, both people are working. And the kids are being shuttled everywhere. And there's all kinds of stresses on our lives, working two or three jobs that make our free time so scarce today that we've got to factor that into what we're asking people to do to participate in the, in the kind of events that we're putting on. Number two is patience has eroded. And it's, lim it, it's related to this time thing, but it's also, uh, it, it's permeated our media. How do we get our media? 140 characters, right? Now, you know, we don't, we don't read anymore. We used to read articles that were pages long. We used to listen to news reports that went into detail. Now we just get the highlights. We, we, we're, we're, we're off doing other things. And so we don't have the patience to hear what is necessarily a complicated story about the pros and cons of different alternatives in our communities. And we're talking about things that can't be simplified down to 140 characters. So when you're dealing with the public, that has a, an attention span of a gnat. How do you communicate things that are more complicated than that can be contained in a headline? Number three, people are increasingly isolated. I saw a really interesting survey uh, that uh, evaluated people's attitudes towards sustainability. You, you may call it smart growth. It, 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 was, it was environmental issues and planning around long-term viability of our communities. 80% of the respondents, in fact, just, just north of 80% of the respondents, felt like it should be one of local government's top priorities. I felt great about that, but it was another stat that really caught my eye. The same 80% of those people felt that only 15% of their neighbors would agree with them on that. 
So we're isolated. We feel isolated. Actually, 80% of your neighbors would agree with you on that, but we don't know it anymore because we don't talk about our values in public anymore. It's not polite to do that. And so we feel isolated. We feel like we're the only ones who care. And that affects your willingness to go out on a limb and share your views. And lastly, people are more polarized than ever. We used to have media sources that showed a variety of different uh, perspectives. Now we have media sources that are geared towards one particular perspective and feeding it to you um, at at a steady 24-hour pace. Your browser, when you open up your browser and you type in to do a search, your search results will be different from everybody else in this room because your search results are based on what you're likely to agree with already. So everybody's being fed this constant stream of information that they already agree with. And so when somebody says something that's counter to it, you think, where did you possibly get that? Everything I see counteracts what you've just said. And it's true because everything that they read supports their current views. So we've become more and more polarized and it's making it more difficult for us to have dialogue with each other even if we do venture out and discuss with our neighbors while we're pulling in the trash cans. So when I looked at this more deeply because I was so traumatized about these events that, uh, that these people that were pointing their fingers at me, I started to think about this in more detail. And I started to think, There's always going to be people who are positive about what you're proposing, and there's always going to be people who are negative about what it... But the vast majority of people just don't care enough to get off their couch to tell you either way. So most people are in the moderate middle. But where you are on this spectrum dramatically affects one thing that's critical to public engagement, your level of motivation to actually do something about it. If you are negative, you are highly motivated. Maslow was right. Anger and fear are excellent motivators. So if you're angry about something, you will go to great lengths to come out and try to avoid it. These people are the usual suspects that you're seeing the fingers of in public meetings. The people who are angry. And so if you have a proposal that you're trying to put forward and all the people who show up are angry, it's possible that you've just filtered out the rest of the people who are either moderate or even positive. Satisfaction or things going well is not a great motivator to come out and participate in something. So the rest of my talk is about how do we access the people who are all across the spectrum and especially the least motivated people who are usually moderate or even edging towards the positive. If you think that your city or town council is doing a pretty decent job, you have very little motivation to do anything but stay satisfied in your couch and watch Netflix. So we've also ran a number of different um, surveys. uh, And this survey, uh, we we talked to 172 different uh, government agencies across the country. And we asked them what their biggest public engagement challenge was. And by far, poor participation was outranked. All of the others uh, wasn't even close. Um, So very little visibility and awareness uh, and involvement in the public process. Um, And they they highlighted things like getting a decent demographic cross-section of the population. They they really felt like they were hearing from a narrow, self-selected group of people that um, show up to everything. Um, As a result of uh, some of the work that we do, uh, as a result of of the trauma that I went through, um, our our company, MetroQuest, um, has developed an online public engagement software for these sort of projects to try to counteract some of the challenges that we're talking about. And as a result, it gives me the luxury of kind of keeping my ear to the ground, working with agencies across the country and figuring out what they're doing to raise the bar. So um, I'm going to talk now about best practices for reducing any of the barriers that you can to public participation in the hopes of accessing that green bubble there, the the full spectrum of people across the range of uh, attitudes and opinions. 
So the first uh, barrier is people are just simply too busy. So the most powerful thing that you can do is to, to do something that's asynchronous. And that means that it's not at a particular point in time, that you can do it anywhere, wh whether you're on the bus, uh, whether you're at home, uh, whether it's midnight, any time that you have a little bit of free time, giving somebody an opportunity to weigh in and share their opinions in a way that meets their own schedule is absolutely critical. So what we have found, uh, and this has changed over the years, we've been doing this for quite some time, it used to be all about uh, desktop computers, and then it was tablets and laptops, and now uh, over 50% of the people that are responding to uh, our online engagement um, uh, surveys are using smartphones. And so uh, if you're going to use online engagement to reach the public, make sure it's delightful on a smartphone. Um, it, it not just works with pinching and zooming, but actually it's pleasurable to do because that's how most people are going to be doing it. And let's face it, we don't need any more animosity out there if they don't like the experience. The second barrier is it's enormously intimidating. Imagine you're one of these uh, not fired up people. You're not terribly positive or terribly negative about what's going on. You're at the moderate middle. Imagine how intimidating it would be to sit in a room full of people with a lineup of people at the mic shouting. Are you going to get up and say, actually, I, 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 I don't agree with everything that they've said. Of course you're not. You're just going to get quiet. And at this workshop that I'm talking about where I got grilled, they had so many people there that all of the other people that were there just got quiet, even though that they were in a complete disagreement with what they were talking about. They just got quiet because they, it, it was intimidating for them. And it's not enough to go online and say, hey, we have a Facebook page, because Facebook is as public or more public than standing in front of a room full of people. Because you, know, you put an opinion on Facebook, everybody sees it, and people start jumping all over. I, I've got tons and tons of threads like this one where people are just being very rude to each other about comments that they've made publicly. So the solution to this is to create an opportunity for people to register their views without fear of intimidation or co-optation or biasing by anyone. So create a private experience where people can say, here's what I think, and it goes to the agency, and they're not afraid of making it public. The third barrier is time. And this, is, this one is absolutely critical, and I, I have studied this in a great amount of detail because, of course, with the complex issues that you're dealing with, we want as much time from people as we can because we want to we want to try to get a lot of useful information from them. We want to maybe even teach them a few things. It turns out that five minutes is about the right amount of time to ask somebody for. If we ask for ten minutes of their time, about seven out of 10 people will say no. And by the time we've got to 15 minutes, we might as well be inviting them to a two hour public workshop because it doesn't make that much difference after that. Three minutes, we don't get much benefit. Five minutes tends to be about the, the right amount of time. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a caveat on this because we design our online surveys to look like they're gonna take five minutes. <laughs> The average person spends much more time than that, but you've got to get them to start. And so the first thing they do is mental math. They get there and they say, how long is this going to take? And they're, 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 talking about, they're thinking about running away. Imagine this person is like the person in the mall and you've got a kiosk set up and, and they're walking by and they're speeding up. They're like, uh, 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 oh no, oh no, uh, uh, don't look at me. That, that person... That, that's your audience. Those are your unmotivated people. So you've got to make it pretty interesting for them, and you've got to make it seem like it's going to be really short. Now, if you suck them in and get them, get, get them going, they might be there 10, 15 minutes later, but it's got to seem like it's going to be really short, and I'll show you a few examples. 
Barrier number four is it can't feel like homework. This is an actual survey. I, I, I've hidden all the names, so I'm not, I don't want to embarrass any agency here, but this is an actual survey about a smart growth project, and it's just ridiculous, obviously, and th this is not something that anybody's gonna do if they're um, not motivated, right? So it can't feel like homework. What we have found is it has to be actually fun. And one thing that we've found that, is that government agencies are a little bit afraid of making something that's fun because it, 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 it might make it seem silly, but it doesn't. It actually shows that you're going to a special effort to make it interesting for people. Visual preference surveys are fun to do. They're also very informative, and guess what? They're fast. Number five, okay, so there's a lot of people out there. So most of us in the room probably don't remember learning all of the things that we now know about cities. Right? We, we don't remember what it was like to not know that stuff. But most of your public don't know any of the jargon, don't know any of the concepts, don't know the cause and effect of most of the policies that you're talking about. And that's a real problem. So, you know, TOD, zoning, land use, density, all these things are not part of the conversation that you would overhear in most people's kitchen tables. What we have found to be very effective is games to make a game. It's important to learn about these complex issues and there's nothing that's more powerful than a game to make it fun, but also to, to plant within that fun experience some learning. They don't even think they're learning if you've, if you've done it well. So I'm gonna show you now a few examples. So here's one way, really easy way, to gamify public input around, in this case, this is uh, Lancaster, Pennsylvania, that was, uh, that was using MetroQuest um, on a comprehensive plan, and here they're asking people to allocate 100 bucks. How would you spend 100 bucks to improve the livability of Lancaster County, Pennsylvania? So it's fun to do this. People start doing it. It takes about 30 seconds or 45 seconds to get it all allocated. But what people don't even realize that they're, that they're learning is constraints. You've embedded something that's almost viral. It's a, it's a viral message that's implanted in the game that there are constraints, that, we can't, that we're going to run out of coins. That's the point. You are going to run out of coins, so where would you put them? So you're trying to develop credible public input that is imbued with some empathy for the challenges that we're facing as decision makers. Here's another one for Truckee Meadows. Uh, um, it, uh, they did a great job on a regional uh, plan update um, in 2017. Uh, this is the trade-off screen. So, you know, these micro-learning moments, one of the, uh, one of the templates that we've, we find quite useful is a trade-off screen. You, you put these trade-offs right in people's faces. So what type of housing does our region need? At one end of the spectrum, housing with more land and less access to services and amenities, or housing with less land and more access to services and amenities. So you're embedding in there a question that I guarantee they haven't spent any time thinking about beforehand, but they're like, huh, that's a pretty tough question. And then they start appreciating it. And then there's questions around transportation or growth or any of the other trade-offs that you're dealing with on a regular basis that you didn't even remember when you learned them, but you've just, you just know them. So translating this for the public in a game-like way, so powerful. So um, here's another example, scenarios. Scenarios are so powerful, giving people views of alternative futures. So here is one alternative future. There's four, as you can see, across the tabs. You're showing a visualization. You can zoom and pan around. You can look at it in more detail. And you're shown in the red and green arrows the pros and cons of that particular scenario. Because as we know, any particular plan comes with both positives and negatives. 
the public need to know that there are trade-offs associated with any direction, but if they have first a chance to say, here's how I would rank my priorities, and then they see the priorities in the ranking order that they put it on, and then they say, you know what? I'm going to vote for this particular alternative. It does really well on my top three priorities. And I know that there's a trade-off, but I'm good with that. If you can then show the results to your decision makers that p the public has been educated about both the pros and cons, they haven't been, been kind of sold a bill of goods, that they appreciate that there's both pros and cons, and they still pick this far more credible than you know, they see a glossy brochure or a nice poster and they walk by it and say, yeah, looks good. Uh, so, so important uh, because we're trying to move quickly with these people, uh, the average person will spend about 60 to 90 seconds on each of these exercises, um, visual preferences. So showing people some alternatives of, for example, housing types that you're, you're proposing. So getting, getting it out there, taking away the words and just saying, what do you think about this? Do we need more of these? Do we need more of those? What kind of sidewalks do, we, do you prefer? This kind of sidewalk or that kind of sidewalk? These, you're educating people along the way of the choices that you have available and then you're collecting their input. And if you're doing this in a structured way like this, you will be surprised at how smart people are at picking things that benefit them as a community. <clears throat> Number six, <laughs> I have seen so many bland promotional strategies that have been prepared by government agencies. Uh, and I, I, I don't want to, I don't want to point any, any out in particular because um, I think we all know that um, when you have kind of a, uh, a, a, a whole group of people that are trying to promote uh, or trying to plan an, uh, an advertising campaign, it can get watered down and pretty bland very quickly and, oh, we have to be more professional about our language and it's just a recipe for something that nobody can relate to. So um, one of the things, my buddy here, Dave Meslin, did a TED Talk uh, and uh, it has been viewed 1.7 million times and it is on the topic of public engagement. So that's a feat right there to do, develop a TED Talk on public engagement that gets uh, popularized. And he had a great part yeah, in this uh, TED Talk where he, he, he said, what if Nike, the shoe company, advertised public meetings, advertise, uh, sorry, ad, ad, advertise their shoes like we advertise our public meetings. So, notice of retail <laughs> purchase opportunity. <clears throat> We've all seen these in the newspapers for public meetings for government agencies, right? <clears throat> My advice to you is have some fun with it. Uh, try, to, try to imagine what you're competing with online. Try to imagine uh, that people are doing this in their spare time. Uh, you're trying to get them away from other things that might be shiny. Um, so I'm going to show you just one example here of something that really, um, I think, was very challenging to get approved, but worked so well. So the city of Nashville was doing a long-range visioning process, smart growth, transit-oriented development, a lot of the kinds of things that you're talking about here. And they created this campaign called, All Right, Nashville, It's Time to Pick. And they, they put these postcards out and online, and it was just curious enough that people would say, pick, pick what? And they would click on it, and they would go to the survey, and they would fill it out. And each time a new postcard came out, there was a whole series of them, we saw a huge spike in the participation. Here's another one. All right, Nashville, time to pick. And this last one is when I picked up the phone and I said, what just happened? Because I just saw the results going through the roof. <laughs> okay, but somebody had to go to the city council and say, we've got a new one. <laughs> Can we put it up? So, 
when you have fun with it, you can really, it, it, it sets a tone that I, I think it's, it's, it's difficult for government agencies to have a tone that feels friendly. And it's one of the reasons why um, I think there, that, that, there's, that there's so much tension between government agencies and the public today that uh, there really doesn't seem to be a great deal of effort on a lot of people's parts to make it really a f fun and approachable. One of the recommendations that we always make to the folks that we're working with is the, uh, for these online uh, public engagement platforms, it's possible to very carefully monitor who you're hearing from and more importantly, who you're missing. So here's a result of a public engagement process uh, that just completed in Los Angeles. Uh, and I picked up the phone when I saw this result because these numbers perfectly match the actual demographic makeup of Los Angeles. And when we looked at income levels in the results, sex and a whole bunch of other indicators, they perfectly matched the uh, demographics of the population. So those kind of results are very, very interesting to me. We have a webinar coming up, which I'd be happy to invite you to, where they're gonna tell their story about how they achieved that result. It was really quite extraordinary. Um, and that's all about really monitoring the results. When you are monitoring the results, inevitably you will come up with some gaps. Uh, it, there's, there's difficult to reach audiences in, in every community and it, it can be quite challenging. What we find is the most common mistake that's made when agencies are putting together public involvement programs is they are forced to define their public involvement program fully before they begin. And most of the money gets spent on high cost public involvement activities such as public workshops and you're engaging the usual suspects there, and you discover halfway through, you know what, we're just not getting single mothers, we're not getting Hispanics, we're not getting, and the list goes on and on. So the most important thing that you can do is save some of your boots on the ground effort, some of your outreach effort for later on in the process when you do have some gaps to run some online campaigns and figure out who are the difficult to reach people that we're just not hearing from. Let's go to where they are. So engaging with the people, the thought leaders in those communities who is the most credible voice in our community, for example, for the Hispanic community? Let's phone them up and let's see if we can get in their newsletter. Let's see if they have any events coming up where we could show up with some laptops or some iPads where we can get some involvement of people that are missing. There are so many cost-effective ways of filling in those gaps, but if you have your entire public involvement program already defined, you likely won't have any room in your budget to do that. The last barrier that I'm going to mention is the why bother factor. Now, we have, through, I, I think mostly inadvertently, burned people out. Good people, people that would participate, people that have participated. And the biggest cause for burnout is, yeah, I know, I did that thing and then I didn't hear anything back. And then they went and did, a, did something that they probably had decided in the first place. I'm not gonna do anything again, what's the point? So the why bother factor is in your control to turn around and it takes a while and it takes consistent efforts to show people that the public input that you're gathering is changing the way you make decisions. So here's an example of a client that uh, we worked with, that, this is Atlanta, uh, and they did a number of different surveys, in this case about transportation. And instead of burying the results of the public engagement effort in page 151 of the appendix of the report, which very few people would ever see, they put infographics together and all of the people who participated got an email and said, your input changed the way we are moving forward as a region. Here's what you told us, and here's what we're doing. And connecting those dots builds a culture of trust and public engagement where those, you know those people are gonna come back. And if anybody saw those, 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 those infographics 
and didn't participate, you know they're going to come back next time because they're being demonstrated that they, they are in control. They're having an effect on the outcomes. So it's important to understand that you have control over what questions you ask at what time. And the number one lesson that I will give you is early on, at the beginning of your process, as early as possible, probably even earlier than is comfortable for you, begin with some questions which communicate to people, we haven't decided what we're doing yet. We would like to know what your priorities are. What issues would you like us to address in this process? What con what's concerning to you that we could help you with? That kind of openness sets the tone for, we haven't baked this cake yet. There's nothing that annoys people more than showing up to something and feeling like, I think they've already decided. Because, you know, we're asking them too late in the process. In the middle of your process, you can then, once you're armed with the priorities of your community and issues that you've collected, maybe 10,000 issues that have been nominated and priorities that have been ranked by 5,000 people, then you can graduate to the next level where you say, okay, you told us this was important. Now here are a variety of issues or scenarios or proposals to respond to. Which of these meets your needs best? So you get to move to that next phase and then as you're nearing the end of your public engagement process, where you've kind of figured out what your direction is, yeah, and you fi you've got the priorities set and you've got the direction set, then you might get into a design conversation of what, what, should, what should it look like? What styles of housing uh, ought, we, ought we promote? What styles of sidewalks and how, how should we integrate with the parks? The more detailed sort of things, which communicate to people we've had input on a variety of steps, and now we're getting down to how should, how should it look. So I'm going to circle back now, because uh, I'm, I'm coming to a close. Um, the focus of my entire talk is that green circle. That green circle is the key, because once you can engage that green circle, everybody, regardless of their opinion across the spectrum of your community, is going to be engaged. Because you know the people who are angry are going to be there. There's nothing you can do to stop them from showing up. And even the people that are positive will be there in small numbers. But those people in the middle represent the average person that casts votes, that just goes to the mall, does their shopping, lives their regular life, doesn't think about planning, smart growth, or any of these other things, but is impacted by it in such a dramatic way, they just don't connect the dots. And it's all about this guy here standing up, maybe in front of you, maybe in front of elected officials saying, we heard from a lot of people, we heard from all walks of life, we taught them about the pros and cons of different alternatives, and here it is on a graph of how they voted on these different options. That feels a lot different than we took the picture from this angle and we, you know, we were pretty happy with the turnout. Uh, there, was, there was nine of us and you know, we had a really good discussion. You know, it's hard if you feel for that guy. So one of the things I did recently at the American Planning Association National Conference is I pulled aside as many of our clients as I could and I asked them one question. What difference did it make? And I got a consistent answer back. They all said some version of this. It gave courage to the elected officials with data. So that, I, I, I love that. I got goosebumps when they said it because that meant to me courage. Packed into that is we wanted to do something different. We wanted to shift our direction from going this way to going over here, but we didn't have the courage to do it. We didn't have any data to support that we could do this safely, that the community was behind it. So giving elected officials the courage to decide to do something daring, different, that's gonna improve the lives of the community with the support of the community, that's why I get out of bed, and I'm pretty sure that that's why you get out of bed too. It's all about delivering quality of life. But as I've proposed to you today, it's not as easy as it used to be to give people what they actually want because there's so many factors in our way. So hopefully this talk has given you some ideas about how some of those 
pretty significant obstacles uh, can and, and have been overcome by different agencies. Um, and, and I hope you take some of the, some of the nuggets home with you. Um, afterwards, I'm going to share with you uh, one resource that I've, I've written um, on the 70 tips and tricks um, that I've gathered that were most effective. You know how I, when I monitor the dashboard of the participation um, and I identify when some, somebody engaged a thousand people overnight, I pick up the phone and when they tell me what they did to motivate people to participate, I put it in playbooks like this. So I'll send that to all of you and hopefully you can use some of that in your promotional strategies. Thank you very much.